continue with the property model of instruments. So in the last lecture, uh, to illustrate the importance to the uh, efficiency for graphic model inference, we start with a chain, right? So uh, this is our graphic model. We assume our first model contains like uh, n variables, and we are connected uh, like x1 connects to x2, x2 connects to x3 until x n minus 1 connects to xn, right? And our potential function is defined on those edges. Number potential function is defined on the maximum click. Uh, for a chain, uh, chain structure model, the, the maximum click is just each edge. Right? So uh, we have a like, psi 1, 2 uh, potential function defined on the edge to x1, x2, psi 2, 3, until like, psi n minus 1 to n, b n minus 1 to n. Right? And uh, if you write down the joint probability, uh, it can be decomposed as a product of the uh, potential function. So it's psi 1, 2, x1, x2, psi 2, 3, x2, x3, up to psi n minus 1, psi b n minus 1, to b n uh, plus 2 values. And we mentioned that the key task in inference is to calculate the marginal distribution, or marginal probability, for one single node or a subset of nodes, right? So if you want to pick up any node in this chain, say Xn, you want to calculate the marginal probability of Xn. So the naive computation is just a uh, sum over all the configurations, sum the probabilities over all the configurations uh, of the variables other than Xn itself, right? So we do the summation outside. So know that this is very, very inefficient. Just suppose your n variables are like discrete, each takes like k stats. So you do you have to consider like the k to the power of n possible config configurations. So this exponential to the number of uh, nodes won't be feasible for, for practice. Right? So the issue is that the key issue that I mentioned in the, in the last lecture is that we do this uh, computation, naive computation, we'll first do the product, then do the sum, right? That's very inefficient. Because every time uh, say we will vary the configurations of the last two variables, and the values of the potential functions for all the other variables, they're not changed. So why should we like recalculate those potential factor values and do the product again? Right? So why not we first do the summation and then do the product? So that's the key idea to reduce the computational cost. So in general, it can be summarized as this distributive law, right? Everybody knows. So if your calculation is to first calculate the product between A and B and product between A and C and then do the summation, that will be less efficient than you first do the summation over B and C and then multiply with A, right? So I want to be more clear, you can consider like you want to calculate something summation like this. So I want to calculate the summation over the product, the summation of the product X1 just over all their uh, configurations. Right? So if you every time just uh, enumerate all possible values of x1, x2 to the product and do the summation, that will be uh, say if x1 and x2 takes uh, k values each, so we have like the k squared operations, right? Because you have the like, k squared configurations. But we know that we can simply first do the summation over x1 and then do the summation over x2 and then multiply them together. So now, the number of operations is equal to 2, 2k, right? The first summation, we need to start over k different values. The second, same, and multiply them together. So you can, in this way, we reduce the, the number of operations by one order of magnitude. So, then we can try to uh, first do the summation and then do the product. We try to make the summation as more inside as possible, right? And uh, turns out that we can break the competition into two parts. <clears throat> One part sorry, is before Xn, and the other part is after Xn. So the 
submission and a product submission product is procedure, which is carried before X is called forward condition. It just starts with X1 and then goes to X2 until uh, our target variable X. And in the backward condition, we start with X big, right? And then you sum and multiply to arrive at X minus 1 and continue until you arrive at X. So finally, end up with uh, two uh, results. One is uh, mu alpha X, and one is mu beta X. So, and this recursive summation can be further summarized as like a, uh, if you define your backward summation at x n as some function, right? Because we do the summation over x one, you get x x two. You do the summation over x two, you get x three. You until you arrive at x n, right? Then this summation result will be a function of x. We define this summation result as a message. It's just very visually convenient or intuitive. Right? You do you define this summation as a message which passes from x n minus one into x n. And if you look at into our decomposition of this sum product, sum product, right? We found that. The submission of XM, I mean, the submission results at XM. So the message uh, from X minus 1 to XM is equal to what? You need to first get a submission result at X minus 1, right? That is the, that is the message from uh, X n minus 2 to uh, X n minus 1, right? You must get this submission results, which is a message, and then multiply it into the potential function. Here, you find out the hash between x minus 1 and xn. Then you sum this product over x minus 1. Then you get the message from x minus 1 to xn. So now, if I want to calculate the message from xn to x plus 1, how can I do that? Just uh, follow this template, right? <coughs> you just uh, like mu alpha x n plus one equals to you do the summation over x n and uh, you multiply your potential function, which is defined here, right? So it's psi n plus one x n x n plus one multiply the message which passes from x n minus one to x n, which is mu. Alpha, Xn, right? Just the sum this product over Xn, you get the message from Xn to Xn plus 1. Right? So similarly, you can use the recursive procedure to compute the backward message. But the directions is like you from the last variable to the last second last variable and to the third last variable until Xn. Right? So Again, yeah. if you want to compute the message from x n plus one to x n, right? you need to sum. You need to first capture the message from x n plus two, right, right after x n plus one to x n to x n plus one. This is a, this message. Then you, you you multiply this message with the potential function part on the end between x n and x n plus then you just sum this product over x n plus one, you get the message from x n plus one to x n. That's the key idea, right? And of course, to, to apply any recursive condition, you need to identify the boundary condition, right? So when we calculate the forward message, we know that we're gonna start with uh, x two. We need to first calculate the message from x1 to x2. How can I calculate it? We know that, I mean, according to this uh, recursive condition, uh, we need to multiply the potential function defined on the edge between x1 and x2 and the message sent to x1, right? But the issue is that there is no message sent to x1. I mean, no. 
far away because there's no preceding nodes there. So we simply replace it by one. Then you get the first message, right, which is sent from x1 to x2. So this is the boundary. The, the starting point of your uh, forward message passing, right? And if you do the backward message passing, uh, you, you're going to start with uh, the second uh, as well, x bit n minus 1. According to the definition, you should multiply your potential function defined on this edge x n psi n plus psi bit n minus 1 n, and multiply with the message which uh, which passes to the XN, right? But again, there's no backward message passes to the XN. So, it's just one. So you get the uh, starting point of your uh, of your backward message pass, right? And then, based on um, the message to X2, you can calculate the message to X3, and then you can calculate the message to X4 until you arrive uh, whichever you want. And similarly, you start with the XN minus 1, I mean, the backward message, you can calculate the backward message to xn, x, uh, xp, x, uh, xp, n minus 2, and, and until you reach the uh, head of the chain. So, that's it. And then, to calculate the margin distribution for any node, just multiply the backward, the forward message with the backward message. Of course, if um, if we are doing like arbitrary graphing models, we need to do the normalization. But, no, but normalization is just normalize this first. Right? So now, this is a summary of your uh, uh, efficient process to compute the local margins. We first compute and uh, Sequentially compute and store all the forward messages. And we uh, sequentially compute and store all the backward messages. Then we do the normalization for any node. We have uh, any node, say, an exam, right? So we just normalize the product of your backward and forward messages. Then you compute the marginal distribution. Just help you to. Uh, Mind what uh, just just help to like review what we have talked about uh, last last uh, lecture. Right? So now I'll ask what is the cost and why is the cost now becomes like this? The cost depends on uh, recursive computation here, right? Like we start from one message and calculate the message in the next node, right? So we know like each message is essentially a, a table, right? So like different values for x and we'll end up with different message values. So it's actually a table. Assume like this this is what we assumed before, like each x and can take k different status, right? So this this will be a p by one table, right? And when we use this recursive procedure to compute the message for the next node, what's the computation cost here? What's the computation cost here? P squared, right? Why? Because like for our actual value of x and say x and take uh, two, right? And to calculate the message value for x and being two, you have to sum over all possible value of uh, x n minus one. So I have a k. K operations into the k. Uh, you, you have to sum k uh, for that values. And now you have to enumerate all possible values of x n and get the corresponding values, right? K minus y is k. K times k is k squared. And you just sequentially sequentially go from like x2 to x n. So it's n p squared, right? Similarly, if you do the backward message, uh, calculation, uh, it is it has the exact same cost. So now we see the cost is proportional to the number of nodes rather than exponential to the number of nodes. That's the key reason why those like uh, um, 
in the market models or the uh, part of speech tagging algorithm based on conditional random fields, uh, they can be applied to very large scale problems. Because I mean, how many how many do you have done like an LP test? Okay, but like CRF conditional random fields, uh, it's kind of like state of bar a classical uh, method. So most uh, commonly use the CRF for speech of, uh, or, or pair of pair of speech those kind of tasks called sequential label tasks. They choose a chain structure. So they have a, like this uh, time cost. Otherwise, you can all apply to like, large corpus. Like. So now I want to ask if I want to extend my task to calculate the marginal of two neighboring variables. So I have a, I have a xn and xn plus one. Right? How do I compute the marginal distribution of uh, xn and xn plus one? After we do this uh, uh, backward forward message passing. Any idea? You may guess. Uh, let's see it again. Yes, exactly. Right? So, it's actually it's pretty straightforward. You just uh, multiply your, so I should say it's uh, proportional to, you just multiply your forward message to your accent with your potential function. Define uh, xn xn plus one, which would be x star n star n plus one x n x n plus one. Then you multiply the backward message to uh, x n plus one. This new data x n plus one. That's it. Then you do normalization. If like if like, there's like a long interval, say you have like x n. And you have to go through some uh, intermediate nodes to write x n plus one. What you do is the same thing. You need to multiply the forward message to x n, the backward message to x n plus one, and also all of those uh, potential functions in between. And if you want to calculate marginal distribution on that, you need to marginalize out those intermediate variables. So that means like if your two nodes are like very far away, the computation cost is still very high. So <coughs> we can generalize this idea to trace. So what is trace? What is a trace? Okay, so activity signal. And connected? Yeah, connected, connected. Yeah. So just the three um, keywords directed up uh, uh, separate and connected. So, of course, if you are, we're, we're dealing with a mark of random fields, undirected graphic model, you, you first need to add some direction. Uh, that being said, you need to set up some root node, right? And you set up uh, the direction from your, from your children to a parent, or, or reversely, whatever. For, for Bayesian network, it's there, right? It's there. You just look at whether, like, between any two nodes, there is some path, um, and uh, also, this, they should not contain cycles. Um, that means uh, any node, it has only one parameter. Right? Of course, root node doesn't have any parameter. It cannot have two parameters. And the key statement is that tree structure can guarantee exact numbers. And this is like really focus on our uh, lecture today. And usually, if you are Graphic model structure contains cycles. Um, there's no guarantee for the exact numbers. All you have to convert your graphic structures into another tree structure. It's called junction tree algorithm. So to better illustrate our like, general um, inference algorithm, which we, which is called sum product algorithm, uh, we're going to introduce uh, uh, another type of um, 
graphing all the representations of factor part. What is factor part? Factor part will be will be more explicitly um, informative about your uh, drawn probability. Well, first factor part <coughs> is a bipart part. So what's the bipart part? So basically, you have like two types of nodes in your graph. And the edges are only allowed to connect between one type of node to another type of node. Between the same type of nodes um, cannot be any nodes, or cannot be any edges. This is called fiber graph. So in the fiber graph, we introduce two types of nodes. One node, one type of nodes represent all the running variables in your probability models. And another type of node we call factor nodes represents the uh, terms in your drawn probability. So remember, you know, you know, you know, Bayesian network, the terms in the drawn probability are those conditional probabilities or marginal probabilities, right? And in Markov random view or on directly graphic models, the terms are are those uh, like potential functions defined on maximum clicks. So we uh, uniformly represent or call them as factors. So here's the here's one example of the factor graph. And from this factor graph, we can immediately write down a strong probability. Right? Because the first f a is uh, a term released to x1, x2. That means your drawn probability, you have a f a function of x1, x2 as the input. Right? And f b released to x1, x2, connects to x1, x2. That means your your, you have like a term in probability, which is fb, x1, x2. So this is a function. And fc connects to x2 and x3. That means you have a factor fc, x2, x3. And finally, fc connects to x3. You have a factor fd of x3. Okay. So factor in this section represents the, some kind of functions, which connects uh, the random variables in your probability model. And more succinct, like giving any factor graph, you can write down the drawn probability as a product of the factors um, over the connected uh, variables. So here, um, again, just like uh, how do you define your um, undirected graphing models, like, we will choose different types of factors, you will end up with different structures. So suppose this is our original probability, the drawn probability, this is our graphing model, right? And if we choose our factor as a function of three random variables, that means we just merge all the three terms together, this is your factor part. You see, this factor m next to uh, x1, x2, three simultaneously, right? If you choose uh, to define three factors, the first factor is Connecting to x1 only, so it is equal to p of x1. A second factor next to x2 only defines to be like p of x2, and the third factor is defined to be this p of x3 conditioned on x1 and x2. Then this is your factor part. You say fa connects to x1, fd connects to x2, and c connects to all three. Right? And a similar thing happens to like undirected graphs. Right? Um, if you are Potential function um, defined on this maximum phase is not decomposable, then you have no choice, you have to define a factor as your potential function. But if your potential function can be factorized as like two um, product two terms, you can define your factor accordingly. So we're going to discuss this general sub product algorithm over the uh, factor graph representation. So the objective of this algorithm is to give uh, an efficient exact inference to find marginals. Marginal means that any marginal probability, uh, the marginal probability for any node in this probabilistic graphic model. And when several marginals are required, we we'll allow the computations to be shared. That means like I don't need to run many, many times every time, for example, if I want to calculate the marginal probability of P of X1, and I calculate once. And when I want to ca calculate the marginal probability of x2, I do not need to calculate from scratch. I can reuse the results. So 
the sum product algorithm is guaranteed to be exact when your factor graph is a trick. If it's not trick, it's not guaranteed. And the key idea is still based on the distributive law. So why is it called sum product? So the naive confusion can be considered as a product sum. Right? You always first calculate the product, then you knew all possible contributions, you do the summation. That's very, very inefficient. So the sum product is trying to first do the sum as many as possible, and then you do the product. That's why it's called sum product. So <coughs> now suppose we are giving a tree structure, graphic model. And this is just a uh, snippet of this uh, uh, model. So our goal is to compute the marginal distribution for a node x. It's an uh, uh, Italian x. It's a nice looking x. And we use both x to represent all random variables in your factor graph. And we denote the neighbors of x by like NES, so N is neighboring. Right? So remember, because our factor graph is defined as a bipolar graph, that means that all the neighbors of a random variable must be factors. So NEX must be all factor nodes. So similarly, like NEF, like NE of some factor node must be all the random variables. So keep it in mind. So according to the uh, naive definition, um, our marginal probability of the small x is the summation of the drawn probability over all the random variables so, um, over all possible configurations of other random variables. Right? So you can imagine that would be very, very inefficient if you do, do, do things like this. Right? But if we can utilize the structure of your factor graph, we assume that your graph has a tree structure, right? So basically, if you choose your variable x as a tree root, then each factor which connects to x will form a subtree, right? And the key observation is here, all the nodes or variables in different subtrees are not overlapping at all. Why? Because this is a tree. Like X has already connect, connected to any nodes in a subtree, right? If subtree, there's some node connects back to another subtree, and it goes back to X. You form a cycle. So there must not have any overlapping between um, the nodes in subtrees. Otherwise, this is not true. Then we can partition. Remember this. Your back is a product of those factors, right? Um, and then we can partition the product factors according to the subtrees. Right? We multiply all the products in subtree one to get one product. Right? We multiply all the products in the subtree two to get product. You get you multiply whatever. Right? And finally, you can represent this joint probability as the product of the products across all the subtrees, right? So basically, you multiply them together, you get this big M, right? You get you multiply them together in this subtree, you get another big M. Right? You multiply all them together in the third subtree, you get together, and just multiply all those big M together, it's the same as your drawn probability, right? Everyone is comfortable. So, so the fact, now the question is that how can we efficiently calculate? Is summation. You want you want to tap you want to sum over you want to sum the drawn probabilities uh, over all the configurations of uh, uh, variables other than the small x. We know that it is a product of those terms like big F. Each small s associated with the factor associated with the subtree. Right? And this big XS are all the variables inside this subtree. So be sure to be clear about those notations, otherwise you will, you will get confused. 
and our key observations that the variables inside this subtree never overlap the variables with this subtree, and never overlap with this subtree, right? So that means if we do the summation outside, we can move the summation inside. That's the key idea of the distributive law, right? Because because your summation is kind of like independent. Right? It just then then before the product, you can first do the summation and then do the product, right? That means you can move it inside, so you, you're gonna still multiply across the results from the different subtrees. Each subtree is determined by one factor which connects to our target variable x. And then inside this, this subtree, we first do the summation. So you're going to start over xs and fs. This is the key idea. Everyone is comfortable, right? Is anyone a few uncomfortable there? A few weird? It's just like something suppose you want to do the product of uh, x1, x2, right? So If you do this uh, summation right, and you multiply a bunch of variables together, and then you do the summation, because you know this is x1, x2, x3, right? Uh, let me let me write down in a, in a more like, concrete that might be better. So suppose you want to do x1, x2, x3, right? and I want to sum over them, right? So because X1, X2, X3, they are not overlapping with each other. Uh, obviously, right? They are different variables. So I can, I can switch the summation and uh, the product. So basically, it is equal to a summation of X1 multiply the summation of X2 multiply the summation of X3. Okay? This is this is before, right? Same thing applies here because. These are for product swap. The results here, this fs, xs, these are associated with uh, this subtree, right? Those are the product. I know the variables inside this uh, subtree, they are totally independent or not overlapping with any variables uh, in other subtrees, right? Then we do the summation outside, it's equivalent to first uh, move the summation into the product. This is a nice looking uh, formulation, the same formulation uh, as we just mentioned. And now we can define this summation. Basically, it's the sum over all the variables on the product inside the subtree as a message from the factor fs to x. So, again, this, this is just, just a sum like a um, very, very intuitive. Uh, or visual analogy. Right? This is sub submission results. Submission, you know, we multiply all the factors inside this subtree and just do the submission over the variables here. You define this as a message from the factor fs to x. New fs to x, x. And this is a function of x. This function of x, why? Because, because this factor associated with x and variables inside, right? And also, this variable may associate with actual factors, whatever. But you just multiply them together, you sum over all the variables inside the subtree, you are you, still coupled with x here because it's factor. So now, with, with this uh, 
summation, we, uh, we denote this summation as a message from the factor known as fs to x. This is our definition. And now, <coughs> similar to our backward and forward message, message calculation procedure, we want to find out some recursive computation protocol to uh, dramatically reduce the computation cost. That's our goal. Definition. Yeah. Message from factor node to whatever. Now, let us look at how can we further decompose your uh, message, right? So, we know that your message is a summation over this uh, big F. This big F is uh, all the uh, factors they are multiplied together. We get this big FS, right? S is some neighbor of X, which refers to a factor, huh? So, sorry, so is this some product algorithm, like, are we kind of showing that it, the, the algorithm itself can be represented by a factor graph, or showing the algorithm that we demonstrated on that linear Markov and field can be generalized to factor graphs? Yeah, let it. Okay. Yeah. So actually, you can see a linear, a chain is just a special uh, tree, right? So I'm talking about a general setting for that. Uh, right. So let us look at this uh, um, big app. It's a kind of a, a bunch of uh, factors inside the subtree multiplied together, right? So <coughs> let's see, we can, how can we decompose this? So to calculate this, this, remember, this is just a product, product of many factors inside a subject. That's it. Don't consider this too complicated. So to calculate, we know that we must multiply the factor fs itself, right? Because we are inside this tree, and the root of this subtree is fs. So you multiply all the factors together. The first thing to multiply with is your factor fs. Right? fs is a function of uh, x is our target variable, and all the other variables which Next to fs. So we denote them by x1 to x big f. And also, each other variables are associated with uh, x return. Why? Remember, this is a trick. Right? That means, well, Xm will be served as a parent for another subtree. So that means, okay, Xm will connect to a subtree. And X1 will connect to a subtree, right? So each variable that connects to Fs other than X will be a parent or will be root for another subtree. Right? So if you multiply all the factors inside that subtree, you end up with this G term. Does it make sense? Remember, this is always a tree. The so tree is a tree of tree. Right? So like, this is a tree, right? So every node which connects that fast will be the root for another subtree. Right? So just multiply all the uh, factors inside this subtree connecting to these nodes. They will you will end up with these terms. So x1, big X, s1, meaning that okay, those variables are connecting to an x1. Sorry, this should be x1 and uh, connect fs to x. It just denotes the corresponding set of variables in this uh, sub subtree. And fortunately, because of the tree structure, those variables in different sub subtrees uh, are not overlapping with each other. Why? Because if they're overlapping, you still get, you still get a cycle. So that means these terms are totally right, decomposable. Right? It's independent. You can calculate them one by one. Right? So let me read this uh, definition again to, 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 to ensure that you're not confused uh, at this point. So X, S, M are the variables, I mean the sub subtree, that connect X. First through X, M, and then through the factor node F, S, then to x. So this is just the sub subtree with xm as the, as, the, as the root, and then connects to fs and connects to x. 
So now, <coughs> if we want to uh, calculate our message from fs to x, we are going to sum over xs, right? the left hand side. And again, we know xs1 to, I mean, big xs1 to big xsm, they are non overlapping. And uh, neither any variables inside this big xs1 to big xsm uh, won't be at x, x1 to x big m, right? So they are separated. That means that, uh, again, you can move the summation into the product. You can, move, you, can put, you can put the summation here, right, in front of each g term. And in front of each g term, you will sum over the variables in the sub subsection. And outside, we need to sum over x1 to xm. That's the uh, nice looking um, uh, form. Right? So you just uh, switch the product and uh, submission, right? You move the submission into the, uh, inside the product. So inside each subsection, you just have to sum first, submission first over this variable, those variables inside the subsection. Then you multiply your factor here. And then just outside you sum over all these variables connected to access at best other than X. And now let us define the second type of message. So we define the summation over the factors product inside the tree, which rooted up with a variable as a message, which is a message from a factor to a variable. It's the second type of message. This is a submission, right? The submission, this submission is over, is on the product of factors uh, with a subtree, or you have a sub subtree, with xm, so, right? So <coughs> we define this results as a message from xm to fs. Message from variable to a factor. And previously we defined a message from factor node to variable node. Okay. So now you can see how um, how we utilize um, the message from variable node to factor node to capture the message from factor node to variable node. And now we want to see like how do we capture the message from variable node to factor node? As, as long as we have a message from variable node to factor node, we can capture all the all the message from factors to variables. Now we want to do it reversal. Like if we if we if we want to compute compute the message from a variable to a factor, how can we do that? We need to look into uh, this definition again. So this is a definition that uh, if your subtree has a root being a variable node and you sum over all the product inside the subtree, this is defined as a variable message from variable node to a factor node. And let us try to decompose this uh, D term. Okay. So this is our target from a message from uh, variable node to factor node. And if you look into the subtree rooted at, at XM, again, this is a byproduct. It's a factor product, it's a byproduct product. That means uh, all the neighbors of XM, all the children of XM in the subtree are factors. And we can define them to be like F1 to F big L, right? And, <coughs> and this product can be further decomposed by Remember, each factor node will determine a subject. Yeah, right? This factor node will determine a subject. And all the variables inside each subtree are now overlapping with each other. That means if you multiply the product inside the subtree, uh, you can do it like independent or in parallel. That means, again, you can move the summation inside. So if we move the summation inside, 
you are essentially calculating the sum of the product inside a subtree, a sub subtree rooted with a back node, which all our definition before is a message from the back node to the variable. So now we see the interleaving relationship, right? Because if you want to calculate the message from the variable node to the back node, we need to calculate the product on all the subtrees which rooted uh, with different factors. And then when we do the comp computation, it is equivalent to capture the message from each factor node. I mean the message from each factor node to the variable. That's good. And because those variables, those factor nodes, I mean they are associated subtrees when we do the product, they are independent, they are not overlapping. So they're just the product together. They're just multiplied together. So we can just multiply all the message, messages from F1 to F L to XM. In other words, if you want to calculate the message from variable to any of this uh, uh, neighboring factor, you just multiply all the other messages, all the message from other factors to this variable. So now we have our like, two message passing rules. Okay. The first message passing rule um, is how can we calculate it from a factor node to a variable node, which is a bit like, uh, is more complex, right? You need to uh, so basically, this is your factor, so this is your variable. So we know this factor can next to a multiple variables, right? So if you want to capture the message from uh, fs to x, you need to multiply your vector, which is cross x and all, all, the, all the other variables. Right? And then with all the messages from other variables to fs, then sum over other variables, so x1 to xf. Right? Then you end up with your message from factor node to a variable. If you want to compute the message from variable node to a factor node, that is much easier. So this is a variable node, this is a factor node. So of course, there can be a multiple factor nodes connecting to a variable node x, right? If you want to compute the message from x to fs, you just multiply all the messages from the remaining factors which connect to x to x. Okay. So that's the tools. And then we just uh, recursively apply the tools to capture all the messages. That's a key idea. Any question? Uh huh. What is this used in practice? What? Where is this used in practice? I was just curious of when you would employ this. In practice? Yeah. Well, a lot of like uh, graphing model inference algorithms are based on this uh, message passing protocol. Um, I can give you an example. Like Xbox. Like Xbox, if you play Halo or whatever like network um, game, like you, you have to find like Enemies, right? You need to find someone who's worth um, fighting with you, right? You don't want to kill someone um, newbies. You want to be, you don't want to be slaughtered by someone um, professionals. Right? You want to find someone who's like uh, almost, I mean, in the same level with you. Right? How do we, do, how do we find, how do we evaluate each one's uh, capability in playing this game, right? Um, this is a famous word. It is a famous algorithm. It's called true skill system. And this is built upon probabilistic graphing models. And the core algorithm is message passing. Any question? Okay. We still need to dive into these 13 videos. So, <clears throat> again, when we talk about any like, recursive procedures, we need to identify the initial conditions or starting point, right? Otherwise, we cannot do the 
recursive uh, computation. So where is the <coughs> where is the initial point starting? It starts at the least. Remember, we're doing we're assuming the graph are trees, right? We're assuming the graph are trees. Suppose you have like a graph of something like that. So the node, so these nodes could be some uh, random variable or position factors. Um, those are possible. So if our relief node are random variables, we need to calculate the initial message from your random variable to the uh, to its parent factor. Right? And then it's simply one. Why? Because uh, According to our uh, message passing protocol, we're going to multiply with the messages from all the other factors uh, to x, right? Unfortunately, if it is a rule, if it is a, a lib node, there is no like, parent factors. So just multiply, uh, just set it to one. And similarly, if your lib node is a factor node, you want to compute the message from your factor node to its uh, a parent node which is variable. Again, there is no other variables which send message uh, to uh, this factor node. I mean, as it's true because this is already a link node. Then you just uh, leave the factor itself. You don't need to multiply some incoming message. And then with this uh, boundary, I mean, with these initial conditions, we can do the sum. But the issue is that, like we know that. The, 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 the interdependencies looks like complicated. So every time we calculate the message from variable to node, you need, you need to depend on a set of message available on the node to factors, or vice versa. Right? We need to carefully pick up a calculation order to ensure that every time when, when I want to calculate one type of message, I have all the required dependent messages available. So here is one. All the messages. So first, we're gonna pick an actual node as a root. So we need to construct a tree. We need to know who is the node, who is the uh, who is the second level of nodes, and who are the leaves. And then we compute and propagate messages from the leaf node to the root. So in the second step, we first start with the leaves. We calculate the message toward the uh, root. No. I'm sorry, I'm drawing the reverse direction. But actually, you have to start from the uh, leaves to the nodes. From here to here, from here to here, and from here to here, and from here to here. And similarly, now uh, another branch you have to start from here to here, from the second node to the root. The second level, and from second level to the first step, right? <clears throat> the second step. And the third step, you probably back. So you start with the root node, then you catch a message back to all the leaves. We're kind of doing things like this. Then this procedure will we will will guarantee that um there's no like embarrassing solutions to happen when you calculate every message. Uh -huh. And the coming back generally means the value is bigger than the propagate back. Yeah, of course. We, when we do the propagation, the propagation back, uh, that means we need to calculate those new set of messages. And of course, you need to depend on the previous messages. Okay. So you and start value. I start. Oh, I start values from leaves. Those are one if the variables. The factors are just the factor itself. And then the second step, you start with those leaves and just type a message upward until you reach the root node. And the third step, I mean final step, you do this uh, reverse thing.
So after the message passing is done, how to compute the variables? And then you very similar to our like, forward and back message uh, calculation procedure. You just uh, multiply you just multiply all the messages uh, uh, passed from your neighbor factor to yourself. You normalize you get the uh, marginal probability. Just multiply the received messages of the variable and normalize as necessary. And sometimes we have to do the normalization. Why is normalization is important? Remember, <coughs> we mentioned at the very beginning. So, in many cases, we want to calculate the posterior distribution. That means some of the part of the variables in your graphing model have already been observed. So, that means in your, probably I use this uh, uh, better, right? So, this is your graphing model, right? So probably like this variable and uh, this variable are observed. I want to calculate the posterior distribution of this variable given the observed two variables. We can still use the exact same procedure to do that. The only change or the only modification is that I need to multiply all the factors related to those observed variables uh, by an indicator function. Or indicator functions like whether this x is equal to some uh, see, observed variable that exists. Then you still do the message passing propagation as one. Why? Because even you do the calculation, you sum over the value of x, right? So if x is not this observed value c6, the sum the sum term is just zero. Right? In this way. You can apply exactly the same procedure, but the result will be like a, a posterior distribution. So this is x0, x0 gave you like x equal to 6. But with that, that being said, like you must do the normalization. Otherwise, it won't be a value for a bit. Does it make sense? So whenever you have some observed random variables in your graphing model, remember. Because we will do the marginalization, we will sum over all configurations of each variable value, right? Of course, we want some configuration to be fixed to be the observed value. Otherwise, we won't compute the posterior distribution. Then we just multiply this indicator function with the factors associated with the variable. That means, like, you can imagine when you do the sum product, when you do the summation, all the sum, although you sum, you still sum over different x values, but only when x takes the observed values, you have like effective summation. Otherwise, it now is zero. Nothing to happen. Yeah, we have to fix the values of those observed levels in message computation. So <coughs> here I want to give you uh, an, an example. Because those uh, so far, those uh, descriptions are a big abstraction, right? So we can look at this. Uh, for example, to uh, to give you a sense of how this algorithm works, right? So this is our factor graph, and according to the factor graph, we can write down this uh, unnormalized uh, the uh, unnormalized probability. I mean, so I, in the factor graph, it's not necessary to require us to have this uh, normalizer here, as long as we know these factors, that will be sufficient. So it will be product of the uh, FA or FA associated with x1, x2. Fb associated with x2, x3, Fc associated with x2, x4, right? This our form. So now, the first step to conduct some product is to identify root. So we can identify, we can use x3 as our root. So this is x3, right? So, well, you can imagine this is a the tree structure, right? So the leaf node will be x1 and x4. And uh, x2 will be some intermediate node, and x3 will be, will be the root. So once we identify the tree structure, 
our second step is to collect the message from uh, bottom to top, meaning that we start with the uh, leaf nodes. So both leaves are variables, meaning that their message to the neighboring parent vector will simply be 1. That's here. Mu x1 to fb is simply 1, and mu fc, sorry, mu x4 to xc is simply 1. Right? And then we're going to calculate the message from fa to x2. So that comes here, right? So the message from factor to the variable node is to sum the product of the factor with the message from the variable to the factor, which is a mu of x1 to a bit, right? Which is 1 from our previous condition. So, so, so sum over this factor, uh, you sum this factor over x1, you end up with uh, your message to, from a bit to x2. And similarly, you can compute the message because we have just sent a message from X4 to FC, right? You can capture the message from FC to X2. So again, apply the rules. You have FC to X2. The message is a sum of the product of FC with the message from X4 to FC, which is 1. So it's on here. You end up with a message from FC to X2. So the message arrived at x2, right? So now with this two becoming message, we can compute the message from x2 to fb, okay, which is here. And, and now, according to the rule, yeah, right, it will be the sum of the product of fb with the message from x2 to fb. So this time it's not one. It's something uh, not trivial, right? So it will be this. And finally, with the message from x2 to fb, we can capture the message from fb to our root node, which is x3, which is a, a simply multiply fb with the message from x2 to fb, which is mu x2 to fb, right? And you sum over x2, you get a message from fb to x3. So we see this procedure, right? So in this uh, bottom to up procedure ensures that every time, every step, you're going to have uh, uh, all the dependent messages uh, available for you to compute the message upward. And I will leave an exercise for you to consider proving it formally. This is not hard to prove. At least when I, when I study this kind of things, um, there's no book telling me how to prove that? I prove that. We finish the second step, right? We collect a message from the bottom to the top. We arrive at the root node. And then we prove it back. That's the uh, third step. Okay. So from the root to the leaf, this is the leaf, this is the root, right? We're going to first calculate the message uh, from uh, the root node. So it's a first child, which is fb, right? So this is a message from x3 to fb. So again, this is kind of initial case, which is just one. Why? Because, uh, uh, because according to the rule, you have to multiply all the messages uh, incoming to x3, right? But unfortunately, unfortunately the x3 is, uh, is a root, so there is no other incoming message to that. So it's just one. Here. And with this message, we can calculate the message from fb to x2 right? here. And again, we apply the loop, so which is uh, multiplying the factor fb with a message from x3 to fb here. Right? So this is a 1. From x3 to fb is 1. So we just sum over fb. We just sum fb over x3. So we get a message from fb to x2. And then 
you can calculate the message from uh, S2 to FD. So now you can see why this is always available. Because, you know, if you want to calculate the message from a variable to a factor mode, you just multiply all the messages from other factors sending to S2, right? So we know the message from FC to X2 have already been computed in the second step. Remember, remember in the second step, uh, we are passing messages uh, upward. Right? So we have already computed this message from FC to X2, and when we do the back computation, we install that computation. Just distributed distribution procedure. We have already got the message from FB to X2, from this parent to X2. So we have all the messages available. Then multiply them together, we end up with a message from X2 to FB, which is here. Okay. Remember, if you want to compute message from variable to vector, um, you just multiply the messages from all the other connected factors to this message, uh, to this parent. And then, similarly, you can compute uh, the message from uh, X2 to FC, right? this part. So now you have a, you know, a second step, you have computed the message from FA to X2, right? From this uh, reverse distribution procedure, you have a message from uh, FB to X2. Now, you're sufficient to compute the message from X2 to FC. Right. While you just multiply the two messages together, you end up with the message. That's how we compute this message. And similarly, you can compute the message from uh, FA to, uh, to uh, X1. Uh, apply the rule is just uh, multiply this FA factor with the message from uh, X2 to FA and sum over X2. You get um, the message from FA to X1. Similarly, you can compute the message from FC to X1. Any question? Yeah. So, any question? Is it more intuitive? I don't know if you feel confusing about that. Okay. Just use your hand, like me, doing this, right? Draw, draw all the message. And look at their path and how they are most how they are passing toward the road and passing back. If you <coughs> want to verify, like if we compute the marginal distribution of every variable in X2, then why we can multiply all the message into X2 together? You can expand all those messages. So according to what we have said, the our normalized margin of X2 is just a multiplication of uh, the message from FA to X2, FC to X2, FB to X2, right? And you can expand the message yeah. according to their own definition. Message is submission of the product, right? You end up with the origin definition. Yeah. So the remaining part is just how to implement this, so I, at least the uh, suitable for you, so that if you want to implement, it's very, very trivial. If you have done some like a tree traversal or whatever, it's very familiar. You'll be very familiar with that. OK, I think, I guess, um, I can only go through this uh, suitable after after four break. So I uh, uh, wish everyone has a uh, the one for public, and we'll see you again.